now I got a lot. Bismillah. Bismillah walhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank him, we praise him, we glorify him. We beseech him to send his choicest salutations upon his most beloved sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. It is said that when Allah Zawjal looked to see who would be his last messenger to mankind, he looked into the hearts of his righteous servants. That we find within our tradition the narration that says, in Allah nadara fi qulub al ibad, that indeed Allah Zawjal, he looked into the hearts of his ibad, the hearts of his righteous servants. And he found that the best of hearts was the heart of Muhammad He chooses him for himself. And he endows him with the responsibility of being the last messenger to mankind. It's critical to understand that when Allah Zawjal is looking to determine who from amongst his creation will be given the lofty and at times burdensome responsibility of being his last messenger for everyone till the last day. The one who will carry forth a testament that will not have anything that comes after, but is meant to go beyond that Mecca in Arabia and to go to communities all throughout the world for generations upon generation. That he's not looking to see and base who that individual will be based off of their culture, their class, their ethnic heritage. The determination is not founded based off of anything external, but when Allah wants to choose His last messenger for all of us and those that will come even after us, He looks to see who has the best heart. And undoubtedly, He finds that heart in the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. And within this framework of social responsibility, we have to be able to start where Allah Zawjal starts. Because he started with the heart, and so too we have to start with the heart. To recognize and understand that our ability to be able to give to those that are around us necessitates that we actually possess something to give to them in the first place. Because you can't give something to somebody unless you have it. So if you have love, you will give love. If you have confusion, you will give confusion. If you have hate, you will give hate. If you have greed, you will give greed. If you have chaos and agitation, you will give chaos and agitation. And may Allah make us from amongst those who bring benefit to his creation. We have a prophet who came not to just revolutionize society within the framework of politics or community or anything of that kind. But arguably the revolution of the Prophet of God was a revolution that was of morals and ethics and character. That he says in his own words that I was not sent but to perfect good character, moral behavior. And in the way that he interacted, in the way that he set forth his worldview that was everything other than egocentricity and was Altogether, a very God-centric perspective embedded within that was the idea that you would treat women well. That it didn't matter what somebody's skin color was. That proximity to God was not rooted in lineage, nor was it rooted in the amount of money that you had. He set forth radical ideas that you could actually be somebody who is a good person and a good Muslim and be really poor. That he stood in front of his companions in his last address to them, saying that no white has superiority over a black, nor no black has superiority over a white. The challenges that we face today that become obstacles in our ability to be able to offer everything that our religion endows us with to be resources for those who are immediately around us and those who are miles and miles away but still share space for us, it's all rooted in what this man called for, sallallahu alayhi wa 
And it starts in here. You can't love somebody if you don't spend time with them. You can't be in a place where you move forward and have that real sense of hub, muhabba, if you just stick with people that are just like you. And if all you see are people who think like you and look like you and dress like you, eat like you, live like you, the world is much bigger than that existence. Why is that important? If you have to bring it back to yourself, foundational traditions in our religion talk about the completion of our faith, the fulfillment of our iman, being rooted in just having love for people. That the Prophet wasallam he sets forth a construct in many hadith that says, you will not enter paradise until you believe. May Allah make us from amongst the people of Jannah. You will not enter paradise until you believe. And in one narration he says, and you will not believe until you love one another. Hatta tuhabu, it's reflexive. Until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. Imam Nawi, rahimahullah, that same Imam Nawi whose 40 hadith, people across ideological and theological perspectives of this religion study, he says that word brother in that narration is not in reference to your brother in faith, but your brother in humanity. That you just love people because you love people. When you read the prophetic biography, you read the books of hadith, you saw that the Prophet wasallam he loved people. And I'm going to say it to you, inshallah, with a sense of love as your brother. And I want you to take a deep look inside of you. And I want you to think for a moment, what would somebody have to look like for you to not help them in their difficulty? What would somebody have to look like in order for you to not invite them to eat a meal in your home, in order for you to believe that you might not pray behind them, in order for you to think that they're not the right person to marry your child? And then you think about it in the framework of those narrations. If we don't love people and recognize what's in here, the biggest difficulty is not going to be to anybody else because this world has an end. But when we stand in front of Allah, that's the heart we're going to bring forward. And so you think very deeply about this man's mission and really what it means to be a part of this religion. That you don't become confined to the false realities of this dunya that tell you that it's it and that's nothing other than it but you see it as a means to something bigger. And you think about how you have inherited it and what you're going to leave in your legacy behind so that it's a little bit better than the way that you found it. With real love, real mercy, real compassion being the basis of it. I've been in parts of this world, man. Conflict zones, refugee camps, the aftermath of natural disaster. I've seen the potential that is rooted in the paradox of us as humanity that the Qur'an speaks about. We have created man in the most beautiful of forms. And then we let them fall to the lowest of the low. In you and I is that spectrum. That is the paradox. That we can be the ones that are projectors of beauty and we can be from amongst those who give ugliness. Which one do you want to be? Which reality do you want to live your worldview by? One that is myopic and says that I'm going to use my Islam to be self-serving or one that understands that your being a Muslim is not meant to just be for you, but you ask the question, how is your being a Muslim good for the people around you? And what does your Islam call you towards? The Prophet was not acquiescent in the face of inequity or an injustice. He sought to be transformative in ways that are remarkable, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.
people in that society literally used to bury their daughters alive in the ground. They used to take men whose skin was black and drag them through the streets because they had no protection. And the prophet, through that prism of good character and the rectifying of morals and ethics, had a heart that commanded the rest of his body to speak out against that ugliness. That he called people to be able to see themselves as something bigger than just consumers of the world, eating and eating and eating and feeding and feeding and feeding their nuffs. But he called them to something that was bigger that said that you need to be a contributor to your society. And we have a lot that we need to build. The masjid is an important institution in our community, but it can't be the only institution. Its purpose in distinct communities can find variety beyond prayer as a primary. Maybe someone uses it as a community space, maybe not. But as an apparatus, it can't be the sole vessel through which we engage, especially within the countries that we live in. So whether you're in Canada or you're in the United States of America, if you stop there, then there's a challenge that's there. And when and how you see through the prism of what it is that you can do that builds with a sense of empowerment, it's going to categorically change how this world functions. I have a five-year-old daughter. Her name is Medina. Please make dua for her. She's an amazing blessing in my life. She has a little brother named Karim. I miss them both very much. I haven't seen them in a couple of days. Medina and I, we had gone to a Dunkin' Donuts near our home one day. I know you might not have those here. It's not Tim Hortons. And Medina has this really unique demeanor about her. So we walked into the Dunkin' Donuts and the poor guy behind the counter, without her even saying anything, smiles at my baby girl and just starts grabbing donut after donut and handing it to her. And she looks at me with her beautiful face and she says, Baba, can I have it? And I'm also easily manipulated by my child. And I said, have as many as you want. And then as we're leaving from the Dunkin' Donuts, there's a man who passes by us and an elderly woman who walked out as well from the same space. And the man finished eating what he was eating and he threw it on the ground, not into a garbage can. And the elderly lady said with a lot of disgust in her voice, can you imagine that somebody would just throw something on the ground? My baby girl looked at her and looked at the trash on the ground and looked at me and then said to the woman, well, why don't you pick it up? <laughs> and then I very quickly jumped and picked it up, embarrassed. <laughs> but Medina knew what she was talking about. Because you can be the person who throws the trash on the ground, the person who's creating ugliness. You can be the person who looks down at the person who's creating ugliness. Or you can be the person who fixes it and recognize what does it mean for you to be a Muslim in that scenario. A lot of people are hurting because we're not building what we have the ability to build. A young woman came into my office some time ago and she told me about her childhood. And in the work that I do, I see a lot of people who are in a lot of pain and their realities, their circumstances are not going to be fixed simply by us throwing at them a religion that is rooted in just legalistic frames. That's there and we can't deny it, but our religion is so deep in terms of understanding how those legalistic frames cause us to something bigger than this dunya at times calls us to. Values, a sense of purpose, a motivation that's not rooted in the acquisition of food or wealth or sex, but the perfection of an internal that recognizes the parts of us that we'll leave behind in this world and the ones that will move forward 
are the ones that can't be fed by things from this dunya. They have to be fed by things from elsewhere. This young woman who's sitting with me in my office, she tells me about how she was born with a facial disfigurement. And she said that growing up in my house, there was a lot of screaming and a lot of yelling, a lot of abuse. She said she went to a Muslim school, an Islamic school, with Muslim teachers and Muslim classmates. And she said her classmates used to make fun of her quite often because of her facial disfigurement. She said, sometimes I would even hear my teachers making fun of the way that I look, thinking that I couldn't hear, but I heard them. And she said, when I got old enough, I decided to have a reconstructive surgery done to be able to fix the facial disfigurement. And she said, when I made the decision, my father said to me that you should not do this. You will never be beautiful. You will always be ugly. And if you don't listen to me, God will punish you. She decided to have the surgeries done anyway. And she said after the first round of surgeries, there were some complications and the doctors were having difficulty in resuscitating her. They thought she had died. Alhamdulillah, they eventually were able to get her breathing again. And the moment she woke up, her father was there and didn't provide any warmth or concern, but said, see, I told you that God would punish you. She went through the second round of surgeries and she said, for the first time in my life, I felt really good inside. That I would look into a mirror and the smile that smiled back at me was something that gave me encouragement. But that was short lived because my parents then sat me down and said, you are not beautiful and you will never be beautiful. And no one will ever want to be with somebody like you. And she said that I realized at that moment just how alone I am. That when I was in that hospital, none of the Muslim kids that I went to my Islamic school with or my Muslim teachers from that Islamic school or the Muslim students from the college that I was at that had a Muslim student association came to visit me in the hospital. And she said, for the first time, I felt care and affection, support, love from the doctors, the nurses, the residents in that hospital. She said, so I took a large metal can and I started to hit my face with it. She said, I hit myself so hard, I lost consciousness. When I woke up, I was back in the hospital and I was very distraught because the doctor said I hadn't broken anything and I was free to go back home. And she said, now I'm just waiting to die. Now I want you to think for a moment, my sisters and brothers, what if that young woman didn't have an office to walk into to talk to somebody? Where do you think she would be? What would happen? If there wasn't a space that was built, constructed with an understanding of where she is. And our responsibility is not to just build for us, but it's meant to expand the us and understand that there's so many out there that are waiting for you and I to live our Islam. Who's gonna build the shelters if not you and me? Who? Who's going to build the free clinics? Who's going to provide the mental health services? Who's going to do that? If the metric of success is based off of the number of people that attend a gathering, the number of people that go to a Jummah prayer, the number of people that come to anything, it doesn't matter if hearts are not being transformed if you have millions of people that are coming and going through mechanics. If your religion is not a factor in changing the ailments of society, what is the point of your religion? To be a means through which you can look down at somebody who is quote unquote less religious? 
to turn it into a weapon, to be able to dictate and decide how somebody else is lesser than you because they don't do it the same way? People are going through struggles, man. Our prophet had companions who committed zina, who drank alcohol, who walked into the masjid and urinated in the masjid. What did he meet them with on a real level? Not something that's idealistic or romanticized. And that's where it has to start from here. Sometimes it's not our fault. A lot of the time, the models and examples that are given to us are those that confine us to thinking that we're not able to be in certain roles. I've had teachers who have studied this dean inside and out. They can answer questions that you have on legal theory, on thick rulings, on anything and everything in that regard. They don't understand institutional development. They don't understand graphic design and accounting and bookkeeping. They don't understand mental health. Their training isn't drawn towards that, and it's not fair to expect them of that. But the need for us is to develop interdisciplinary communities that leverages the talent of everyone in the room and allows for us to see that we each have something that we can contribute if we can recognize in that way. And if you only see somebody based off of what they can't be, that doesn't tell you a lot about that person. That's telling you a lot about yourself. If you get to a place where your entire being is in an uproar because somebody who doesn't practice a certain way walks into Allah's house and you don't want them there because they're not dressed right or look right or they're not the right skin color, and it happens. I went to a masjid to speak and hours before, they said to me that on the basketball courts outside of that masjid, there was young black men pray, playing basketball, and doctors from the masjid who were Pakistani came out and said to those young black Muslim men that if you don't leave right now, we will call the police on you. And if you think that that's disgusting, then don't keep your children from marrying people who come from different races. It's the same racism. And Iblis was the first racist. And if Allah cast him out of Jannah for that nonsense, what are we going to do when he asks us about why we mistreated people through the same prism? I've had friends of mine who know every recitation of the Quran beautifully. And we've walked into masjids in our country, and people won't pray behind them because they're black. They'll push other people forward who have atrocious understandings of tajweed. But the connection is based off of externals, not internals. Then that's not Islam. That's something other than Islam. We have to start empowering people based off of where they come from. And you saw this as a challenge during the time of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, who is the second caliph in our religion that under him the Muslim community expanded immensely, that of him, amongst many narrations, the Prophet Sallallahu says, لَوْ كَانَ نَبِيًّا بَعْدِي لَكَانَ عُمَرِ that if there was a messenger after me, it would be this man Umar. Before Umar became a Muslim, nobody thought he had anything to offer. We have narrations in our tradition where Umar radiallahu an, he speaks of moments that make him laugh and make him cry from his days of jahiliyyah. That many of you probably know the instance where he says that he was on a journey and he forgot his traveling idol at home, so he fashioned a makeshift idol out of some dates that he had, and then later on when he got hungry, he started to eat that which he was worshiping, the idol made out of dates. And it brought a smile to his face. 
In the instance that makes him cry, he says that customary at that time was that people wanted sons, they didn't want daughters. And when a daughter was born into a family, they would literally bury the daughter alive. And Umar radiallahu an, he says that I can remember my daughter's hand going limp in my hand as I buried her in the earth. And in some narrations it says he could feel her hand whisk against the bottom of his beard. And it brings tears to his eyes. That Umar, he had a servant by the name of Lubaina. And before he was a Muslim, he used to beat this woman so hard that when he would stop, he would say, don't think that I'm having patience for you or sympathy. I'm just tired. And when I get my strength back, I'm going to do it again. That there's narrations in our tradition that speak about Umar radiallahu an drinking alcohol consistently before he became Muslim. And everybody identified him through these things. On one occasion, he sees a woman by the name of Layla, and Layla looks as if she's going on a journey. And he inquires as to what is taking place, and she says, you have made it very hard for me to worship my God here. I'm going to go someplace else where I can worship him. And she expects now an onslaught at the hands of this man, Umar ibn al-Khattab, this man who drinks alcohol, this man who buried his daughter alive, this man who beats Muslim women. And to her astonishment, he says, go and have peace on your journey. She goes home and tells her husband, a man by the name of Amr, and Amr says, what is it that you're saying? You sound as if you believe that Umar ibn al-Khattab could actually become Muslim. And she says, why can't he become Muslim? And he says that, know this, the donkey of Umar's father will become Muslim before he does. Nobody thought that there was anything good with Umar ibn al-Khattab except the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And where everyone else was looking to point out deficiencies and shortcomings, the Prophet uniquely was making dua, Allahumma izzal Islam bi habara jalani ilayk Amr ibn Hisham or Amr ibn al-Khattab, that, oh Allah, bring some izza, some strength rooted in dignity and respect by the one of the two men who is more beloved to you, Amr ibn Hisham or Amr ibn al-Khattab. And we know how the dua is answered. That Umar radiallahu an, he accepts this deen as part of his truth. And he moves forward in a way where the situation changes drastically for the Muslim community. He knocks on the door of Abu Jahl. And he says, Marhaban ya Umar, that his champion is here. And Umar simply says to him, Aslamtu, that I have become Muslim. He says, La taf'al, don't do it. And he says, Fa'alt, it's done. And then there's silence, because what's he gonna say to Umar ibn al-Khattab? For the first time, they can walk in the streets with Umar radiallahu an leading one line and Hamza radiallahu an, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in front of the other line and the Prophet standing between the two lines because strength is coming from individuals. And it's transformational. There's two things you want to think about. One, where would we be if Umar believed all the bad things people said about him? You are bigger than the worst of your actions, man. And nothing you can do is greater than Allah's mercy. If there are fools who identify you solely through what they perceive your shortcomings to be, then know that your God is greater than them and live to serve him, not his creation. You be in a place where you understand most definitely you have something to offer that there's beauty within you and we can't benefit from the blessing that is uniquely you unless you share it with the rest of us. And most critically, you don't want to be the people who are turning away Almers, who because of you, they feel as if they don't have something to offer or contribute. They don't have something that they can pass on. The paradigm of gatherings that are divine in our tradition is deeply contrasted to gatherings that are human, where our gatherings primarily are based not off of who we let in, but who we keep out. I work at New York University. I used to work at Princeton University. It's one of the best universities in the world. And the manner in which Princeton maintains its reputation is not just students who come with certain SATs and co-curricular activities and GPAs and whatever. 
But Princeton is also Princeton because of who they keep out. And I didn't get into Princeton, so if you didn't get in, it's okay. And if Princeton started to let everybody in through its gates, it wouldn't be Princeton anymore, would it? But you think about Allah's house. You think about what it means to build and serve, to have the honor of being a part of the establishment of a house of God. And you can have the best of creation enter into that house. You can have the most horrendous of creation enter into that house. It doesn't take away from Allah's majesty. Everybody is entitled to have access to Allah. Our gatherings have to be similar. How often do you worry about what people will say based off of who you let in? How often are you concerned at what would happen if you invited that person from a different race, a different class, a different ethnicity into your home for a meal, your iftar dinner, your Eid gatherings and celebrations? You should rejoice when people who have struggles with alcohol, with drugs, who have come out of prisons, show up in your Muslim spaces. Not be in a place where you are worried, but you should be in a place where you say, I must be doing religion right. Because who are the people that came to the prophet of God early on? Bilal ibn Rabah, Khabab ibn Arat. Suhaib al-Rumi, Salman al-Farsi, these were not people of Quraysh. And when you're talking about people who are a little bit more rough around the edges, Abu Dhar of the Ghaffar tribe was not a man who came with the best reputation. But he was from amongst those who had deep proximity to the Prophet of God because he was connecting from here and he had a genuine love for people. What are practical things that we can do? In the coming days, dare to push yourself to go and find communities, populations, people that you could fully get away with not being with, and you seek to serve them. If you are responsible to be leadership in a Muslim organization, community, in a family, any type of space, Sit down and talk to people. Ask them of their opinions. Ask them their ideas. Ask them what their needs are. Do surveys that are rooted in data that are basis for which you build whatever it is you're building. You have gatherings that are like this, then utilize the opportunity for real strategic planning and development. I can't tell you what to do in Windsor. I'm not from Windsor. As much as I'm not from Detroit, Michigan, I could tell you that if you live in this area and you are Muslim and you haven't done anything about water issues in Flint, then you're not practicing your Islam well. You want to know what it's like to be a survivor of domestic violence and how you can provide for sisters, children, individuals who have gone through that harsh reality, sit down and talk to people about it. You wanna know what it's like to not have health care. You wanna know what it's like to be falsely imprisoned. You wanna know what it's like to be worried about your immigration status. You wanna know what it's like to never be invited to a gathering on the day of Eid, where nobody gives you a gift, nobody hugs you or invites you to their home. You want to know what it's like to actually be a convert in the Muslim community, where people jump up and down when you enter into the faith, but they don't speak to you a day after that day? You want to know what it's like to be black? If you're not black, you can't do it if you're not going and spending time with people and just listening and hearing. And if you don't know about people's existences, you're not going to build for them what you have the ability and means to build for them. You take your individual experience, you root it in real strategic growth, and then you just live your Islam, man. Remembering who your teacher was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You don't take standards from this society that is rooted in the ugliness of ego but you transcend the nafs and you appeal to a higher level of consciousness that's rooted in seeking nothing less than the pleasure of your Lord, a Lord who looks for reasons to accept from you rather than reasons to push you away. 
So find confidence in what you have the ability to offer. And go out and build with your companions, your friends, what it is that we're in need of. And allow for yourself to understand that all Allah wants from you is to try your best when you live to that potential. And I'm going to tell you this, and then I'm going to stop. I don't believe that we don't have what it takes. And I feel that our fears are not rooted, our inhibitions are not rooted in a lack of experience, resources, credentials, money. But I think our biggest fear is rooted in actively embracing our potential to be real catalysts of goodness, benefit, and beauty. That once we actually admit that we have ability to be purveyors of real light in days that at times feel so dark, then we'll have really no excuse to be able to say why we're not doing what we have the ability to do. Start somewhere. Do what you can. Hold the door open for somebody. Let somebody else eat before you. Smile to someone. Go and find somebody in this hall that you have never met before. Shake their hand. Give them salam. Ask them how their heart is. Let them tell you stories about what they've seen and expand for yourself your horizons. And then be the challengers of what it is that exists around us that's ugly because we are meant to be those who remedy with real beauty. So you take on classism, you take on racism, you take on every social injustice and inequity because that's what our prophet taught us to do. You build with excellence, real ihsan. You give of your money where you need to give it in order for those things to be built. And then you just keep pushing people forward so that they might try to do the same. If I can ever be helpful to any of you in whatever it is you have going on, please don't hesitate in reaching out. It would be an honor and a privilege to be able to return some of the hospitality that I've received from your community while I've been here just these few hours so far. And if this is the only time that we're meant to be together, then I pray, inshallah ta'ala, Allah Zawjal gathers us all together again in the best of places in the world beyond this one. But keep me in your prayers. You and your loved ones will be in mine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and protect us. May he bless us with knowledge that benefits us. May he bless us with a tawfiq to understand and implement that knowledge into our daily lives. And may he guide and bless us all. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa billahi tawfiq. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.